See if I can get her for you. If. Okay. If Judy Flynn is in the room, there is a gentleman up here to my left on the, um, that would like to see you. It's rather important. So Judy Flynn, if you're here, there is a gentleman up here to my left. If you could touch base with him, that would be great. Thank you. I mean, I knew the payment we wanted to do open form because some, I took an excellent point. Oh, uh, I, after the presentation, a number of people came up and said, well, one guy who's an actuary said, oh, he's great, but he's <laughs> Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, if you would take your seats, please. Our next topic is the appeals, and our presenter is Patricia Pergal. She is the, with the Retiree Drug Subsidy Chief Legal Counsel for Government Services Group, VIPS. Patricia is a, an accomplished health law attorney with over 10 years of experience specializing in regulatory compliance and government affairs. Patricia joined the VIPS team to provide legal counsel for CMS's retiree drug uh, subsidy contract. She is responsible for the general oversight and coordination of all legal matters concerning program development, operations, and compliance. Patricia has significant experience working with healthcare organizations, insurers, providers, and government officials on issues involving Medicare, Medicaid, and HIPAA. Patricia earned a JD with specialization in law care, health care law from the University of Maryland School of Law, Baltimore, Maryland, and an MS in public health from Case Western Reserve University, Cleveland, Ohio. Now, she is our presenter. However, all good presenters um, sometimes have assistants, and she has a, a panel of assistants that will be up here with her. Um, Brian Maho uh, Maloney, um, Pat Ambrose, Kenneth Cole, and Joanne Sosnick. The lady in front of me, um, Kathy, also known as Vanna, um, is going to be up here with her throughout the presentation. And having said that, um, I welcome Patricia. I'd like to talk to you about the RDS appeals process today, um, but I want to tell you about something that happened yesterday that made a few cogs in my mind go around, and uh, I, I thought that I would share that with you today. I also thought I would incorporate it into my presentation. About two days ago, I was looking through my slides, and I noticed there seemed to be a series of three in every slide there was always three bullets or three things in common. And I thought about it, I thought it was really interesting. Now I know that some of you may be thinking, come on, get a life. Um, but I will admit that I have recently read the Da Vinci Code and the rule of four. <laughs> so maybe I was seeing something that wasn't there, but I still thought it was interesting. And I also found it to be a very helpful way to remember different things about appeals. The second thing that happened yesterday was that at the end of the day, I went back to the CMS room and I said, okay, where's my pile of questions for appeals? There was piles all over the place. There had to be, you know, over a thousand questions. 
I thought, I, you know, let me see what the questions are, and I'll incorporate them into my presentation. There were no appeals questions. I felt bad. <laughs> and I said, oh my, I wonder if that means people aren't interested in appeals, and I'm going to bore them with my presentation. Somebody looked up at me and very kindly said, yeah, but they expect you to be boring. You're a lawyer. <laughs> so I don't know if that was a lawyer joke or not, but anyway, so last night I thought about what can I do to spice this up a little bit. Well, with the help of Kathy Winfield Jones and thinking about the rule of four and the Da Vinci Code, just think of the appeals process as being the rule of three. I'm going to go through the appeals process and where I found those aggregate rules of three. Kathy is going to notify you to keep heads up and see if you can find them also by playing our little Okay, so with that, let's get started. <coughs> okay, what I'd like to talk about today is just um, the appeals process in general, what can be appealed, the <laughs> steps to an appeal, and then something that was mentioned earlier, actually, in our um, previous payment session, and that is reopenings. The RDS appeals process is at 42 CFR 423.890. Now, I don't have a statutory site there, and the reason for that is that there is no appeals process in the Medicare Modernization Act. As Mark Hamelberg mentioned yesterday, and as Jim Mayhew has been mentioning, CMS has had the opportunity to be very flexible with this regulation. CMS decided that they felt that you folks, people applying for the subsidy, should have some type of a, a due process. So in the regulation, they did include an informal appeals process. And again, um, it's at the, this regulatory site. All appeals activity, as, as has been mentioned, will be conducted through the secure RDS website um, with the, the sponsor's homepage or application page. And the filing will be required to be in writing. Uh, and it can, the, the um, appeal, sorry, I got a little, <laughs> I, I kind of just tuned out when I heard that. Um, appeals, <laughs> may be, <laughs> appeals may be filed by the account representative. There you go the account manager or a designee. Now, one thing I want to say about my designee here is that I had already started this um, presentation before I appointed my, my designee, so I appointed her midway. You can do that too. Um, if you find out that you need to appoint a designee, well, let's say even during the reconciliation process, if you need to do an appeal, you can appoint a designee any time during the process, during, the calendar, during your plan year, during the reconciliation process. If you do find that you do need to file an appeal, you can appoint a designee in the appropriate manner that Pat discussed yesterday. Um, so that flexibility is built into the system. Also, with the appeals process, there is the ability to submit attachments, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, decisions. Uh, decisions, the decision of an appeal will be, the response will be sent by email to the requester, letting them know that uh, a determination has been made on their appeal. Um, the full decision of the RDS Center, uh, uh, as far as the appeal goes, will be found on the sponsor's appeal page. And then also, if there is a determination that's in favor of the sponsor, the RDS Center will implement that within 15 days of the notice of 
the determination. Now, as far as submitting an appeal, if you think back to yesterday and to the website that Pat and Dave went over, um, the account representative, account manager, or designee would go to the RDS website and log in. They would go to the plan sponsor application summary page, and then they would go to the section where they want to um, appeal. There'll be a drop-down box, and then they will select the appeal uh, function from that drop-down box. That will take them to a <coughs> form that they can complete. You can uh, submit attachments to that and submit that. If you have other attachments or other things that you want to submit um, to have considered for your an appeal and you don't have an electronic version, you can submit a hard copy. Uh, we have a PO box that will be set up for appeals uh, for hard copies. And um, you could also fax, and we have a secure fax um, at our uh, appeals vendor. But we would do and encourage you to submit everything electronically. What may be appealed? Subsidy payment amount. The determination of actuarial equivalence and also the eligibility of a covered retiree. Now, if somebody saw this slide and they said, those aren't three, there's four, can you count? Well, the last, the last line on this is similar determinations to those three areas of appeal um, that CMS determines, you know, it might be in a gray area and CMS determines that it does fall into um, one of those other areas of eligibility <coughs> or amount of payment. See, am I wrong? Um, there's three levels of appeal. An informal written consideration, uh, informal hearing that will be conducted by a CMS hearing officer, and also a request for review by the CMS administrator. Now the last um, level of appeal, the review by the CMS administrator, is discretionary. As far as the informal written reconsideration, that is um, the reconsideration, the request must be filed within 15 calendar days of the initial determination, adverse determination. Um, again, you would go to the website and file your appeal there. The content of the appeal should be the issue and dispute, the reasons for the disagreement, and then anything that you want to attach or submit um, to support your case. I do want to emphasize that the record is established at this reconsideration level. So get everything in there that you have available um, that you think is in support of your appeal. This, it needs to be um, submitted at this point. Also, the initial reconsideration is the ter determination <coughs> is final and binding unless you do apply for a CMS hearing officer hearing. The informal hearing. Um, it's conducted by um, a CMS hearing officer and it follows uh, an adverse uh, reconsideration decision or a reconsideration decision that um, upheld the initial determination that was adverse. It must be filed, again, within 15 calendar days of the reconsideration determination. Again, specify the issue and dispute, reasons for your disagreement, but no additional evidence is allowed, okay? So again, you establish that record at the reconsideration level. It is conducted by a CMS hearing officer, and the decision is final unless you request a review by the CMS administrator and the CMS administrator grants that review. Hearing options. If you do request a hearing by a CMS um, hearing officer, there's three types of hearings that are available. On the record, via telephone, or in person. Now, in person or by telephone, oral argument is allowed but no testimony. So again, you can go and you can plead your case as long as you stick within um, and 
use all the evidence that you've already submitted. You can try to get up there and start including some new facts and some new evidence um, that would be considered testimony. If you do opt for either um, an in-person hearing or telephonic hearing, the CMS administrator will notify you 10 days prior to the hearing of the date and time of the hearing. Uh, the third type of hearing, as I mentioned, is on the record, and the CMS administrator would look at the record from below, from the reconsideration decision, and consider all of that um, information, and is um, including the documentation that you submitted as far as the reason for your request in making a final decision. And as far as selecting an option, you do select that option at the time of filing for a hearing officer hearing. The last level of appeal is review by the CMS administrator. And I'll just let you know, as it looks now, um, that will be conducted by Leslie Norwalk, the Deputy Director of um, CMS. It is available, uh, review by the CMS administrator, is available following a hearing officer decision. It is, however, discretionary. So even though you submit a request within 15 day, calendar days of notice of the reconsideration, I mean, of, of the hearing officer determination, it may not, your request may not be granted. But again, when you do file a request for a review by the CMS um, administrator, you want to specify the issues in dispute, the reasons for your disagreement, and no additional evidence, again, is allowed. Now, the review by the CMS administrator, if you get that far, is final and binding. <coughs> Okay, <laughs> reopenings. There are three bullets on this. Um, reopenings, and this is something that we were just talking about uh, previously with payments. Reopenings apply to initial determinations as well as reconsideration determinations. They are discretionary. You can request a reopening, um, but it will be the RDS Center's final determination whether to grant that reopening or whether to conduct a reopening itself. The decision not to reopen is final and binding. <laughs> Basis for reopening. So when can a reopening happen? Within one year of the determination, again the initial determination or the reconsideration determination for any reason at all. Within four years of that determination, if there is good cause, and then at any time, if the determination was obtained through fraud. What are the bases for good cause, or what is good cause? If new and material evidence is unavailable at the time of the initial determination, if there was a clerical error in, in computation of the payments, and then finally, good cause is if on its face, the evidence that was considered in making either the initial determination or reconsideration determination, determination was clearly erroneous. So the, these are the three areas or reasons for that are considered good cause. Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> okay, there's no good cause. <laughs> although I could probably turn this into three bullets if I wanted. Um, no good cause exists if the only reason for a reopening is a change in legal interpretation or an administrative um, ruling upon which the initial determination was made. So in other words, there's no re retroactive openings for good cause because the law changed or because um, there has been an administrative ruling that um, varied from the initial reason for um, conducting, making the determination. And with that, Kathy, I want to thank you very much. Let's hear it for Kathy. Uh, my account.
representative, account manager, thank you. And we will be ready to take questions. Kathy, don't go away, Kathy. I may need you. <laughs> did a good job. I like that little thing. Where'd you, where did you get that? From the guy outside. You took it off the guy outside. Yeah. <laughs> Only attorneys can do things like that, right? <laughs> OK. For my facilitators that are facilitating the microphones, if you will uh, find your microphone, we are going to another live Q&A. If you have questions, please line up behind one of the microphones. We will start again with my immediate right and work our way over. One question per person, name, organization is optional. Anybody have any questions about um, the Da Vinci Appeals. Code or Rule of Four? Again, now be patient. They have to get up, and you know it, it's okay. <laughs> Attorneys are are not boring. I don't think so. Not at all. <laughs> well, we're going to change things a little. The gentleman in the green shirt to my right or to my left. Uh, thank you, uh, Jim McDonough from Bridgestone Firestone. Um, somewhat related to the appeal process, but. If we ne don't necessarily want to appeal something, but we want to uh, audit the amount of payment so we can verify that it is correct, will there be opportunity for sponsors to be able to do that? That is a CMS policy question. And Jim Mayhew, if you're, are you within? Can we hold that until uh, Jim? Is Jim here? Jim? If Jim does not come back by the time we finish, please write that question down and hand it to me, would you please? we Will do. Thank you. Thank you. The lady to my right, please. Robin Haggerty from Mercer. I'm not sure I'm clear on what a reopening is. Is that CMS opening a case, not the employer? Right. That's CMS opening the case. Um, an employer, uh, a sponsor, plan sponsor can request a reopening, but it is uh, CMS or the RDS Center making a determination whether to reopen a case. Um, and again, there's the three, um, <laughs> the three um, opportunities for reopening that I listed and that are in the handouts. So, so the reopening is the appeals. Pro I, I guess I'm not. It's sure kind I'm of an addendum, I, I guess, to the appeals process. In the reg, it's included under the appeals section 890, um, but it's almost um, another opportunity to reopen again a case or to relook, take a look at the case after the plan sponsor has gone through the appeals process. The one thing about um, the reopening, again, that I want to emphasize is that a plan sponsor can request it, but it really is a determination that will be made by CMS or um, and the RDS Center working together to um, decide whether or not to reopen a case. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. The lady to my far right, please. Hi, Julie May with Coventry Healthcare. I uh, had a quick question that if Could we Could you speak submit... closer to the microphone, please? Sure. Thank you. Is this better? That's much better. Thank right. you. If we submit via the monthly retiree list a retiree that we subsequently receive a response that they're not eligible, do we go through the appeals process to get that corrected or simply in the next month put that retiree back on with a retroactive date? Joanne and Pat? I think it depends on the reason for the rejection and your feeling about that. If you believe that the RDS Center has made an incorrect determination about a retiree's eligibility for the subsidy, then that would be an appeal of that retiree's status. If on the other hand, um, we're telling you that um, this particular person is not eligible for the subsidy be, uh, because they're not um, entitled for Medicare, mm -hmm. then, um, and, and, and you agree with that or you, you don't know any differently, um, then that would be, and, and then you, ha you obtain information, let's say, from the retiree that um, 
they now are entitled, then you would just resubmit that record um, on an ad, as an ad in a later submission of your retiree file. Does that answer your question? Um, I, I think what you're saying is if it's, let's say, an eligibility question, we have documentation that they are in fact eligible, but the response came back that said they weren't, we would just simply resubmit them? <clears throat> Actually, if you do, in that case, if you feel um, that the RDS Center was incorrect in its determination, you would, I would recommend that you appeal it so that someone look at it. We have a um, process for our RDS Center staff to take that um, inquiry and go out and, and do um, an online lookup in, of the Medicare beneficiary database and work with you to find out um, why your information differs from what Medicare has. I mean, of course, um, maybe the information was not um, completely up to date on the right. Medicare beneficiary database at the time that we made the determination. Right, that's often the case, it is timing. Mm -hmm. And our, our RDS Center staff could, you know, basically troubleshoot that situation. So that's a telephone call to well, the RDS you would, staff? In, in, the, in this case, you would um, submit your appeal online in the, mm -hmm. um, in the, on the uh, secure website, and that then uh, request would be transferred to an okay. internal um, staff person who's working, you know, would work that out. If they make a determination, then you know it follow, you would be notified via email, et cetera. You may get a phone call um, to talk about the situation and if additional supporting information is needed. So I think just to kind of confirm, what you're saying is if that situation occurs, we can take one or two tracks. We can either resubmit in a subsequent month if it goes through, great. If we don't feel that that's going to be a good option, we can go ahead and put an appeal in. Yes, ma'am. Okay, right. thank you. Also, I just want to say, remind you that there are reason codes for rejecting um, any of the retirees. So if the reason code is something um, that's not based on updated, having updated data, then that's probably something that you would want to appeal. The lady to my far left, please. Jane Gilbert with Kentucky Teachers Retirement System. My question is in regards to the 15-day limitation. With the first retiree list submission um, being submitted with the application, and my understanding is CMS will have a response file back around November 1st or somewhere in November, the 15 days to me on that first submission does not seem realistic. I mean, you're looking at thousands of responses and reason codes and I'm just asking, does the 15-day limit apply to that or apply to that first submission? Again, that's um, I think that CMS has to make that determination. The regulation does say uh, 15 days from the date of the um, adverse determination. So as soon as you get notice, um, in the case that you're talking about, that a retiree is not qualified, uh, that would start the 15-day clock now. Um, we can take that back to CMS and ask them if there's any um, flexibility or Brian? Yeah, no, I, I would agree with what um, Patricia is saying that it would apply that's um, to that uh, initial retiree list submission um, regardless, unfortunately, of the volume that potentially could be returned. Thank you. The gentleman to my left, please. Hi, I'm Miguel Marzell from Becker Corporation. Uh, we, our company has a rather unique plan design, and our actuaries right now, uh, I guess we've stomped them because they don't know if our plan is going to be credible or not. So my question is, if our actuaries think that the plan is credible and is submitted to our DS, and then you think it's not, what are the procedures then? Would then we then appeal, or is it just no at that point, or how would we go about it? Well, again, that's, a, that's an interesting um, question because I guess you're, uh, I'm just thinking through the process here. Your actuary probably wouldn't want to attest to the gross and to the net of the option, so that would hold you back on being able to submit an op application. Um, no, no my, my question is if, let's say, the actuary and us feel that it is credible. Oh, and you want a confirmation. You then review it, and then you say, no, it's not. Right. So that's my question. Yeah. 
what the RDS center, the RDS center won't be going back and looking at the actual uh, actuary calculations of plans. That will be done during audit. Um, and I know that we're going to be talking about the audit process um, this afternoon. Now, Brian, has CMS de determined or made a decision whether or not if somebody wants to come forward to Right. I mean, I think if, if, we're, um, if you submit your application and we're denying it based on um, it not being creditable, then that's something that you would want to ap appeal through us. I mean, that's... I, I think the question is, is that in good faith, the plan sponsor and the actuary believe that, um, that the uh, plan meets the gross and, and net test but they're not 100% sure because it is a, a strange configuration. Right. So you would, you would suggest that they appeal that? Or? We, we can, we'll, we'll look into that and we'll get back to you on it. Okay, thanks. Okay. Thank you. The gentleman to my far right, please. John Bryson, Anthem. Um, my question is similar. Uh, on the appeals, it talks about determination of actuarial equivalence and just a further explanation of what is being appealed because I was assuming that once the actuary signs off on that, it's, it, it just goes forward and uh, I'm not sure what would be appealed. Well, again, with, um, with the appeals process, that is something that we are still trying to think about all of the issues that may come up and all the scenarios. Um, and you're correct that with the application that the um, actuary will be signing the application and attesting to the fact of the gross and the net uh, value. Where I could see there being a question about the actuarial equivalency may be um, as a result of an audit where it's questioned or um, some other process where um, CMS or OIG or whoever will be conducting the audits uh, does have a question about the actuarial equivalence. But during the application process, you're correct. The, the actuary will be filling out the application, attesting, and then getting into the paperwork and determination of actuarial equivalence would be something that would probably come later during an audit. The gentleman to my right, please. I'm George Cooper from Ingersoll Rand. My question concerns its follow-up to the question about the 15-day rule. We, um, we're going to submit a file in September that's based on the 1106 population. And then in October, November, we're going to go through an open enrollment period with our retirees that typically changes our population by 10 to 15 percent. So if that file is then ready to send to RDS in December, uh, how are we going to address the 15-day rule? Pat, do you have suggestions for updating uh, files? Well, I, I have actually kind of, I, I need to ask you and Brian a clarifying question. Is it, does the 15 days, would it apply, he's going to send us an updated uh, retiree file, an update file in December. Mm -hmm. um, then let's say that you know we receive and process that file by December 30th or something. Does he have 15 days to appeal anything that's on that updated file from December 30th? I think that is that pretty much, or does that's it go it, back I, to the initial submission of September 30th for his initial retiree file? I would think that we're talking about the update file that he would have. Yes. Yes. That's correct, the, the update file. If there were any rejections on the update file, then you could appeal that. So you've got 15 days for each file? Yes. Correct. Thanks. Correct. We're going to go to the lady to my far right and then the lady to my left. So the lady to my far right, please. This is another question about the eligibility. Um, can multiple beneficiaries be included in one appeal for the same reject reason? Well, actually, the way that we are currently designing the appeal process on the SECURE website is that it's one retiree at a time. And we will certainly take your feedback if, 
if that requirement needs to change in a future release. Um, but at this point in time, it's retiree by retiree. I also um, would like to quickly clarify something that was said previously in Tricia's presentation. If you have attachments or other documentation that you need to submit with your appeal, um, again, the first um, implementation of the appeal process on the SECURE website, you will not be able to attach it and send it to us on the appeal form that you're filling out. Uh, we hope to add that functionality later. So if you need to send additional documentation, it has to um, come to the PO box that will be published on the website for appeals or um, possibly fax it in. I'm not sure if a, fa a fax number mm -hmm. would be available as well. But that functionality will be added to, uh, to be well, able to attach. Well, I, I am hoping to add that functionality, yes. <laughs> okay. The lady to my left, please. Ronnie McDonough, Kenna Metal. My question is, the 15 days, is that business days or calendar days? They are calendar days. Oh. And the lady to my far left, please. Kara Jarab, actuary with Watson Wyatt. Um, I have a question about the situation that the gentleman raised where a client has a very close to coal plan design and you know they might even be within our thresholds that we're not sure if they're actuarially equivalent or not. What is the process that CMS has set up to, or is there a process that CMS has set up? Is it working with say Paul Spitalnik in the Office of the Actuaries? How do we get some more clarification in those kinds of inst instances? Well, I, I think just as a, a point of clarification, when the applications first submitted, we're, our, we are going on the attestation of the actuary. We are not initially going to be looking behind those, um, the, the working, looking to your work papers or anything like that. That's going to happen um, subsequently during the audit process, and so that's when a, a potential appeal would come up if we just determined at that time that the coverage wasn't creditable. But in terms of um, getting more information, yes, we would be working closely with our Office of the Actuary. And, and you mentioned Paul Spitalnik. Yes, he does work there. And we would, we would work with him to provide whatever, to get whatever guidance us non-actuaries need to, to convey that to, to you all. Okay. I mean, the problem with the audit process is it's after the fact. Right. And so the subsidy's been received by the client, and then there's monies that mm -hmm. have been transferred, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, what we would like in the circumstance where a an organization's plan design is very close to have some kind of process um, with CMS to get some kind of guidance around the specific issues. So, just a thought. Um. No, I, I, we definitely appreciate that, and we'll talk about that. And uh, in a little while, we're going to be having the um, the presentation on audits, and there will probably be more information provided provided there on that. But we can certainly. Um, you know, take that into consideration. Thank you. Thank you. The gentleman to my right, please. Um, yes, my name is uh, James Burris. I'm with the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And, and, and to reiterate the concern about the 15-day uh, period, particularly with the uh, initial submission, I'm going to submit a file to you that's going to have upwards of 40,000 people on it, uh, some of which uh, you may or may not reject. Uh, it's going to be difficult for me to review any rejects within a 15-day period uh, and, and, and determine, you know, if any supporting documents are going to be required, uh, you know, with that kind of numbers. And I'm sure that there are um, employers out there that have even greater numbers than I have. Is that 15-day, uh, particularly with the initial submission of files, going to be firm, or is there any kind of flexibility in that regard? Well, I'm hearing a consistent concern in that, those 15 days, and um, while I am not in the position to um, speak right now about what we would do um, to that matter, I can certainly take that back to um, individuals like Jim Mayhew and Mark Hamelberg, and we'll, we'll address that accordingly. If, if at all possible. And uh, just to um, clarify, too, the regulation does say 15 days. Um, so 
Could I make a suggestion um, when it comes to the retiree files? If a retiree is rejected on your initial submission, um, there's really nothing stopping you from sending that rejected record again on an update file as an ad record again and attempting it. And so that um, buys you another 15 days, I guess we could. <laughs> um, you know, it, it's just a suggestion, but I, you know, it might be um, a good recommendation to address that concern. The lady to my far left, please. Jane again with Kentucky Teachers Retirement System. Jane, could you come closer to the microphone, please? Question in regards to the response reason codes of three, four, and five. Will we be rejected for receiving a subsidy based upon our system having a different spelling of a first or last name in compared to Medicare's database? There is a matching process. Um, on the Medicare beneficiary database that does involve the use of last name. Um, they have a scoring system, and um, unfortunately, I don't know it off the top of my head, but um, we're going to take that, either the Social Security number or the um, HIC number um, that you provide us, along with the, the name and date of birth, and those um, gender, those are the basic um, elements. So um, if I... I don't know if we need to have an exact match on the last name, but there is a matching algorithm, and I really can't fully answer your question today, but there is the possibility that if your um, information about that retiree is different from what is stored on the um, Medicare beneficiary database, that we would not recognize that person and, and reject it, reject Thanks. the record. It's possible. So that would be something that we need to turn around and appeal in 15 days. Yes, and as I said, um, as you you could make a you know correction to your file, try to find out from the um, retiree what is on their um, uh, card, their Medicare card, update your file, and resend the record as an ad again, and 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 allow it to go through that way. Thank you. The gentleman to my left, please. Another question regarding the initial application with the, uh, the eligibility and understanding when retirees, if they try to sign up for Part D, they may be informed um, because CMS already knows that they have employer coverage. I guess my question is when will we, the initial determination be provided back after the initial application and with the eligibility? Um. Let's see if I understand your question first. Um, you have submitted a retiree uh, cl to claim the subsidy, and we've accepted that record and posted a subsidy period. Uh, we put that subsidy period then on the Medicare beneficiary database, and for this um, initial period of time, we're trying to do that before open enrollment for Part D starts November 15th. Um, it will, uh, what will happen is if we have posted this um, period of subsidy for that retiree on the MBD. Um, when they go to a Part D plan and attempt to enroll in Part D, uh, they will initially receive a, a rejection um, and be informed by the Part, uh, Part D plan that um, you are already claimed by your um, employer's subsidy program. You don't need to you know, they'll try to do some outreach and educate them. At that same time, the RDS system will receive an alert or a notification from that um, Part D enrollment system, and we will turn that around and send it to the plan sponsor on the notification file. So you'll start receiving those um, on November 15th and subsequent. Um, then to finish up the process when the uh, retiree the, re, uh, the retiree or beneficiary can override that rejection and insist upon signing up for Part D, it's their right to do so, um, we will then alert you if that will actually close out or end your subsidy period appropriately according to the dates for the um, Part D eligibility and inform you of that on a, on a notification file that I discussed yesterday. And, and again, that would start November 15th and, and going forward that that sort of transaction would take place. Okay. So just a follow-up question. When we um, supply that initial 
eligibility, I think, on September 15th at our application. When will we receive the determination on that initial eligibility file? Um, you, we should be able to turn those files around in a couple of days, um, but we have a, a service level agreement of 15 days. But it really is a, the process is um, we send a, an inquiry essentially to the Medicare beneficiary database and we ask, um, you know, a checking on the, the eligibility and entitlement information for that retiree, make our determination, create the, the subsidy record on our own database, and then create a response file for you and send it back. So it really should be a couple of days. Okay, okay thank you. The lady to my right, please. Yeah, I understand that um, plan sponsors have a 15-day limit in which they're supposed to make their appeal if there's going to be one. What is the time frame in which RDS has to make its decision with respect to that appeal? The RDS Center has a, an agreement with CMS to make a determination um, on the reconsideration request within 30 days. Now, at the hearing officer level and at the administrator level, there are no time frames um, associated with the hearing officers or the administrator turning um, a request around. Um, they are going to try to, to do it as quickly as possible, but of course there's other uh, issues that the hearing officer and the administrator's office are dealing with. So there are no specific time frames um, for the hearing officers nor the administrator. But that initial reconsideration is 30 days. Okay, thanks. The gentleman immediately behind you, please. Is that me? Uh, I want to lay out a, something of a scenario here. We have, uh, we submit 40,000 some odd names um, and you reject some percentage of that group. Um, and we have the 15 days to appeal that. Um, you had suggested that we could resubmit those names at the following month or the, during the update file, at which point you may accept those names that you previously re rejected. Now, is, have we lost that month which they were um, rejected. So for example, you had them in for a full 12 month period, but they were rejected for uh, the month. Um, now you've resubmitted them, they've been accepted, but now you've only got 11 months of subsidy for that individual, not 12, because you didn't appeal their re initial rejection. Um, actually, once you, you would have them for the full 12 months if we made that determination on the, the secondary, you know, when you send the file the second time. We will um, take information that you're sending us. You'll, you will request the full 12 months for that retiree um, as long as, um, according to our records in Medicare entitlement and eligibility, if we will backdate it, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> Sorry. The lady to my far right, please. Um, Patricia, this is another question for you regarding the verification. Is there any kind of a verification or audit process that will be um, implemented for a Part D provider that tries to resubmit a beneficiary a second time prior to the employer even talking with that member? I mean, you know, what? what audit or procedures will be in place to prevent that um, from happening where the Part D provider actually resubmits that member uh, and, I, and they're really with the employer. Yeah. Could I um, hold that and have our audit um, presentation address that issue? I think that that would probably be the most appropriate place okay, to address that. And we're taking notes of that right now. That's the presentation that follows lunch. Our time has lapsed. For the two gentlemen that are there with questions, you each have a facilitator. If you would write those two questions down I will and bring them up to me, then I will be sure that we answer those. We are now adjourned until 1.30 um, p.m. Thank you.
Before we begin the program on program oversight, Mark Hamelberg has some uh, comments to make, and so I will turn the program over to Mark. Thanks, Rob. Can you hear me? Can we get the mic in front of uh, Mark o open, please? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, a couple of uh, clarifications based upon some uh, issues and concerns that were raised before the break, before lunch. The first is that there was a question or two dealing with um, uh, the case where uh, liability under the plan may accrue for the payment of a drug cost, but actual payment doesn't occur until um, uh, the, the next plan year, or the plan doesn't know about that obligation until the next plan year. Um, our intent is to say in that case that your uh, ability to get the subsidy payment relates back to the year that the claim was incurred, not to the year of actual payment. Okay, so um, uh, I had a request to say it again. So <laughs> it relates back to, because you liked it so much the first time, she actually doesn't trust me to say it the same time, same way again. It will, in this situation, for example, if uh, a cost, an obligation under the plan to pay a drug cost uh, arises, say, in December of a given year, and uh, the plan's uh, an obligation to pay under the plan doesn't actually get found out, and payment isn't actually made until the subsequent year, the, the, the event that triggers the subsidy payment relates back to the prior year, not to the next year. So the question was raised, for example, well, what if we have this situation where it occurs and in the following year we're not even taking the subsidy, do we lose that potential subsidy payment? And the answer is no, you don't lose it. It's all going to be relating back to the prior year, okay? Obviously during the reconciliation process, if there are adjustments in what was actually paid, whether it's because of actual rebates incurred, whether it's because of um, uh, coordination of benefits activities that adjust what was actually paid. Those will be fleshed out in the reconciliation process. But uh, again, you're going to be focusing on a plan year basis. Is that clear to, to folks or reasonably clear enough that I can go on to the next issue? Okay. Uh, and I'll, I'll be hanging around through the rest of the day and we also have, um, well, I'll be hanging around through the rest of the day. Uh, the next issue has to do with appeals. There were some uh, concerns raised about the 15-day uh, uh, appeal rule in the regulation. And I believe Patricia did indicate in the, uh, uh, in the presentation prior to the Q&A that the 15-day rule isn't the only uh, type of appeal provision that's available. In fact, there is a rule that allows up to one year requests for reconsideration of a decision uh, for no reason at all. There's an even longer period, I think it's four years, for good cause. But there's a one year from the date of the initial determination that you can request a reconsideration, a reopening uh, from the peanut gallery over there, called a reopening. Now, a couple of things to mention here. One, as Pat Patricia rightly pointed out, the, the regulation is written in a way that says that CMS has the discretion whether to reopen. But I can assure you that particularly in the early years of the program, that CMS will be extremely flexible and generous in, in this area. So uh, if you are unable to uh, submit within a 15-day period um, a, um, a, an appeal request on a rejected enrollee, uh, that doesn't end it for you. The matter will not be over. Obviously, we need to create some standards in the process that even on an intermediate or an interim basis, we get some finality so that the system and the processing can go forward. But if you're unable, uh, because you have, I think the example was given 40,000 retirees or more, if you're unable within a 15-day period to figure out what's going on and to uh, request a, um, a reconsideration of a rejected retiree, you have not lost your ability to appeal it and that we will be extremely flexible in making sure that the right information, uh, both we have it and that you have it, and that that, re that reopening, we can relate back to you know, the first day of the period, whatever the proper period is. So I, I hope that gives people some additional level of comfort 
uh, you're not going to have to forego vacation the entire year. You will be able to get this resolved. Is that okay too? Any? I'll take I'll take applause for that as well. Thank you. <laughs> Can use validation. Um, <clears throat> and that's it. I'm going to now turn it over to your regularly scheduled program. Thanks. In a minute, you'll see why I'm smiling. It, it's kind of, <laughs> kind of fun. Uh, we are going to have a slight change in the afternoon program, which I think will be very beneficial to all of you. We are not going to go to the program oversight Q&A after the presentation. What we are going to do, because of the amount of interest generated, both yesterday and today, and the volume of questions both formally, informally, offline, uh, by all of you, which are really some of the best um, feedback that we've had throughout these conferences. And it's really important that when you leave here at the close of the conference today, that you feel that you have enough information to do what you need to do in a short period of time. And if you don't have that information, you know where to get it. So what we are going to do is immediately after this panel is done, we have rescheduled the break. The break will be a little bit longer than what is scheduled now. Then we are going to set up an expanded panel so that when the questions come this afternoon, um, in addition to those from today, those from yesterday, um, that we will be able to provide the best um, responses to those questions as possible. We will be using only written questions, and the panel has spent most of their lunch hour going through to try and make sure that we address those that are going to be the most pertinent and relevant. Again, all the questions eventually will show up on the website. And I say eventually, it takes someplace around six weeks. But we're trying to look at a way that, given what we need to know about this group, that we can find the most expeditious way possible. So that is why the decision was made to expand the Q&A for this afternoon. So having said that, um, they've just handed me something that I probably need to figure out what to do with in just a second. Oh my goodness, anybody missing a cell phone? It was found in the ladies' room, so I'm going to assume it belongs to one of you ladies. And um, if the opening, if you can tell me what it says on the opening screen, which is really quite unique. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's really re unique. But it does say vibrator on, so that, that's an even better thing. So, you know, that, that's, that's a good thing. Now, when this, when this lady comes up here, don't all of you applaud at one time. <laughs> but actually, if the owner of this will see Janine, Janine is this lady right over here, she will have it in the back of the room if this is your cell phone. <laughs> don't go there now. Don't go there. You don't want to do that. Okay, our program oversight is being presented by James Crawl, Marilyn Harrington, and David Lemire. I will introduce each of them individually. Marilyn Harrington, retiree, um, drug subsidy, fraud, and abuse manager, Arkansas Blue Cross and Blue Shield. She is an accredited healthcare fraud investigator as designated by the National Healthcare Anti-Fraud Association. Marilyn implements all fraud management procedures for the RDS Center and prepares all fraud and abuse reports. She is the primary point of contact for law enforcement requests and all CMS communications concerning fraud and abuse related to the retiree drug subsidy program. Marilyn is also the primary contact for all law enforcement agencies in the six state Arkansas Blue Cross and Blue Shield Consortium. She has served as their Medicare fraud and abuse investigator and supervisor. 
Marilyn previously worked as a white-collar crime and consumer fraud investigator for the Arkansas Attorney General's Office. James Crawl is the health insurance specialist for the RDS operations. He is a health insurance specialist for operations with the Employer Policy and Operations Group within the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. He is responsible for helping establish operations for the RDS program. James has over 15 years of Medicare operations experience, including project officer responsibilities in the areas of EDI operations, electronic attachments development, contractor performance evaluations, and HEPA transactions. David Lemire is a CPA manager in the Office of Audit Services for the Office of Inspector General in the Boston Regional Office with over 18 years of experience with auditing. It is my pleasure to welcome this panel. Good afternoon. Can everybody see me now? I have to get on my soapbox for this, so y'all just please bear with me. Did everyone have a good lunch? Is everyone sleepy now for a nap? Go ahead. It's all right. Let's get started here. Okay, that's not my slide. I am the manager of the fraud unit for RDS. I have worked in Medicare fraud since 1997. I worked at the Attorney General's office in Arkansas prior to that uh, in consumer protection, in white collar crime, and in Medicaid fraud. And while I was uh, with Medicaid fraud, I did a lot of pharmacy cases. And so that just kind of blends over into RDS. <coughs> Excuse me. To launch right into this program, um, the goals of the Benefit Integrity Unit. The first one is to confirm the identity of individuals and organizations in the RDS program. We have to know who we are doing business with. We have to know that the people that we are making payments to are really who they say they are. And the process of confirming the identity of the individuals who make application to the program actually begins with the application process. If the um, individuals in the application uh, department for some reason have problems confirming the identity of a person who has made application, um, for some reason they just can't find information or whatever the case may be, uh, they will send it on up to the fraud unit. We'll take a little bit closer look at it. Um, nothing to be worried about there unless you're not really who you say you are. Um, another goal is to make the accurate payments and to protect the Medicare trust fund and detect and prevent fraud and abuse. That is our number one goal, to detect and prevent fraud and abuse on the front end. We don't want to have to pay and chase. Occasionally we do, and we will, but we don't want to have to. Um, to detect and prevent fraud, we will do this by both proactive and reactive means. And I'll get into that in just a little bit. The primary responsibilities of the Benefit Integrity Unit are to respond to complaints of fraud and or abuse. If you see that your employer or someone that you know maybe not is not doing things just exactly like you think they should be done and you think maybe something's a little bit strange, you can call our customer service line. They will take the information that you give them and they will uh, pass it on up to us in the fraud unit and we will take a look at it. Um, we will respond to all the complaints. Uh, responding to the complaints is a reactive method. We will also do proactive methods of detecting fraud by doing some data analysis uh, on payments, uh, that kind of thing, to see if there's any aberrancies, to see if there's <coughs> someone who's really an outlier uh, as far as payments go. So uh, we, we plan to do both of these methods. We develop cases for referral to law enforcement. 
we will take that complaint or we will take the results of that data analysis. We will work it up to a certain point where we feel that there is a strong indication of fraud and we will then refer it to uh, the Inspector General's office or to other law enforcement uh, to see if they are interested in pursuing it and to support law enforcement is our third responsibility. Um, whenever we refer a case to law enforcement, we obviously send them all the information, all the data that we have. Uh, when they really get into the meat and bones of an investigation, they usually will need other information, and so they come back to us for that, and we will have to go to the other departments. They may want to see the application file, uh, they may want to see an appeals file, something like that, but the law enforcement will come back to the fraud unit and we will um, handle all of their requests for them. Okay, this is just a definition of fraud, but there again, this is what everything is based on. Fraud is the intentional deception or misrepresentation which an individual knows to be false or does not believe to be true and he makes it anyway knowing that the deception could result in some unauthorized benefit. Fraud is intentional. It's not an accident. It's not an error. It's not a keystroke error. Fraud's intentional. It's planned. Some examples of the potential fraud that could occur in the RDS program. And again, this program is very new. Um, we're still feeling our way around. Uh, when it's all up and running, we will have a much better idea of what we may need to look for. Uh, some examples of potential fraud, and I hope you all don't get uh, any ideas from this, these slides, though. <laughs> so, um, you know, if you think you might, just close your eyes. Submitting false information on the RDS program application, false information on the retiree list, or creating false or misleading documentation on the actuarial, actuarial equivalence. Say that three times in a row. Some more examples, false or misleading data on your drug costs. Submitting false or misleading data regarding rebates, other price concessions, or false or misleading documentations in appeals. These are all pretty self-explanatory. The actions that can be taken if fraud is identified, of course, we will refer to the Office of Inspector General. Um, if they decline to take the case, uh, we may uh, get CMS approval to take it somewhere else, possibly to the FBI or somewhere like that. Um, hoping that someone will, will pick it up and, and run with it if we really have a strong indicator of fraud or what we believe is fraud. Um, an action that can be taken is exclusion from participation in federal programs. If you are convicted of a crime in a federal program, you will be excluded from doing business with the federal government. And this is across all programs. Um, Administrative sanctions, that can mean a suspension of future payments by RDS, um, or we can withhold an overpayment amount from future claims. The civil monetary penalties, those can be levied by the Department of Justice as fines or restitution. Okay, the referral to the OIG, the Office of Inspector General. We've already talked about the first two bullets on this slide. The last one, however, the criminal penalties, incarceration, fines or restitution, asset seizure. I have been to numerous fraud conferences where some of the speakers have been either Inspector General's office members or FBI members. Uh, they did their presentation and the first thing they like to do is to throw up um, pictures of automobiles uh, boats, other properties that they have seized. They really, I, I don't know if they get extra points for that or not, but <laughs> they really like to seize those assets. We don't do that. We're, we're the good guys. We don't do that. 
some situations that may not be fraud. Making a drug cost calculation or processing error. Unknowingly submitting incorrect data on rebates. Unknowingly submitting incorrect information on retirees. Now the key words here are error and unknowingly. Everybody makes mistakes. I don't know anybody that walks on water. We're all subject to mistakes. And so if that's what it is, an honest mistake or an honest error, um, we might tell you about it, we might help you correct it, but we're not gonna work a fraud case, we're not gonna refer you to law enforcement because fraud is intentional. Okay. Abuse is the incident or practice of plan sponsors that is inconsistent with accepted sound business or fiscal practices. These practices may directly or indirectly result in unnecessary costs to Medicare and or the RDS program. An example of abuse may be where the entity submits a list of retirees and none of them are eligible <coughs> for the subsidy. Okay, we'll tell you if you submit a retiree that is ineligible, we will send that information back to you. Um, if you just keep on submitting that list over and over and over again and you submit payments over and over and over again and try to game the system in the hopes that one of these claims will get through and get paid because the system may be confused from all the information that you're sending to it, this is abuse. This could also be fraud. It just depends. But. Um, I know that everyone here is very honest and that they may make mistakes, but they're never going to commit fraud, right? Okay, when abuse is identified, if payments are made in error, the RDS program, RDS Center, will send a demand letter out to the plan sponsor who got the money. Um, we will ask them for the money back. They're um, are some other some other language that goes in that letter um, if the overpayment amount is not sent back within a certain amount of time um, we can withhold from future payments and as a last resort CMS may give us the authority to suspend all future payments until the issue is resolved and I've been involved in some uh, payment suspensions in a former life and it hurts. It hurts the providers, it hurts the plan sponsors because all your money is cut off. It's 100% payment suspension. Um, education warnings. You may receive some written correspondence from the RDS program saying that maybe this isn't exactly how you need to be doing things. Um, once you're educated if it happens again and again and again, that's abuse, could be fraud. Um, we'll turn it over to law enforcement or CMS and see what they think about that. And then again, the last bullet, refer to the CMS or law enforcement for audit or investigation. And as much as you don't want to see me appear on your doorstep, and you don't want to see OIG on your doorstep. You really don't want to see an auditor show up on your doorstep. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, Jim. Had to throw that in there. In conclusion, we believe that most plan sponsors will be honest, careful, and conscientious. We know that you want to do a good job. We know that you don't want to see any of us. We know that mistakes can and do happen. Sometimes they happen over and over again. Um, if that's the case, we may contact you and say, hey, what's going on? Is there something we can do to help you to get over this hurdle? Whatever we need to do. The Benefit Integrity Unit will not refer plan sponsors to law enforcement unless there is evidence of fraud. And again, evidence of fraud means that fraud is intentional, that we have, to, we have a strong suspicion that it was intentional. And remember that when someone commits fraud or abuse, they're taking money out of Medicare. We all share the responsibility of protecting our Medicare benefits. And it's everyone's job to be the eyes and ears of the community 
and to let us know if they see something wrong out there. Uh, we'll be glad to take whatever information you want to give us, call the hotline, call the uh, customer service lines. They will connect you with either me or someone in uh, the fraud unit. We'll be glad to take your information um, and see what we can do with it. But again, it's everyone's job to be ever vigilant and to help us preserve Medicare for future generations. And that's all I have right now. I'm going to get off my soapbox. Good afternoon, and thank you for staying. <laughs> I'm Jim Quell from CMS, and um, I want to continue the discussion on program oversight, and in particular, uh, speak about the RDS program audits. I'd like to share our vision for RDS program audits and where we believe we are going and, and what we are thinking currently. Um, essentially, we're looking at uh, two types of audits, a random audit where um, the plan sponsors will be selected using statistically valid random samples within strata based on plan, sa plan sponsor size. And what that means is we would take the uh, plan sponsors um, and possibly put them into a small, medium, or large size based on the number of qualified retirees and then do our st statistically valid random sample within each of those uh, segments or strata, stratum, excuse me. Um, another type of audit is targeted and um, Essentially, the uh, subjects would be selected based on information derived or received by CMS from RDS center referrals, random audit findings, complaints, and or law enforcement officials. Those are um, some specific examples of how we would get to the targeted. And uh, right now, um, we believe our audit categories would be credible coverage disclosures, actuarial equivalency attestation, and subsidy payments. Um, and how this would work with the random sample is, again, going back to the plan sponsor um, um, sizes, small, medium, and large. Um, we would um, select our st statistically valid random sample within, for example, the large um, plan sponsor size, and then we would look at these, these um, audit categories if, if a particular plan sponsor was selected. We would look at the credible coverage, the equivalency, actuarial equivalency, and the subsidy payments. I want to talk uh, briefly about the uh, credible coverage disclosure. And the purpose is to determine if plan sponsor credible coverage disclosure is in accordance with the law, regulations, and CMS guidance. And that's um, the authority is 42 CFR 423.56. I'm sure you're familiar with that citation. For credible coverage disclosure, um, what will be examined? At this time, we are thinking that we would look at the actual um, co credible coverage disclosure that was made by the plan sponsor, whether it be a letter, a bulletin, or a, a 
plan benefit booklet. And then we'd like to know the intended target audience for the disclosure, whether it be the entire qualified retiree population or some segment, depending on the medium you've chosen to reach the, that select retiree group. And then also we would like some type of evidence that the disclosure occurred, for example, what retirees did you contact, that type of thing, and what date did you contact them. Regarding the um, actuarial equivalency attestation, the purpose of, of this audit is to, um, to confirm that the plan is at least actuarial equivalent to standard Medicare Part, B, Part D drug benefit. And currently, um, when performing this type of audit, we believe at this time that we will be actually looking at the um, actuary working papers to determine if uh, the actuarial principles were correct, you were generally accepted, and also the accuracy of the gross value test calculation and the accuracy of the net value test calculation. Another category is the, um, of audits is the subsidy payment audits. The purpose of this audit is to confirm the accuracy, the accuracy of plan sponsor payment requests and RDS center subsidy payments. At this point, we envision that we'll, we will be examining the RDS center electronic funds transfers and remittance advices the plan sponsor payment requests and the source data such as uh, drug claim rebate, chargeback, and price concession data. And currently we do have some open issues as we um, go down the road of audit. And uh, for example, how will we get the source data to the auditor, will it be electronic or hard copy? And will, they, will there be a particular format or, or record layout? Or could we build on something that's in existence today to make it easier for you all to uh, provide the information? And then also, what proportion of the audits will be desk reviews versus on site? And um, that question may turn on the percentage of electronic, um, percentage of audits that can be performed electronically. And um, that's it. Do you want to do something? Okay. And I'll turn it over to Dave from our Office of Inspector General. <coughs> Good afternoon. My name is Dave Lemire. I'm with the uh, OIG, Office of Audit Services in Boston. I'm here to discuss briefly today uh, the OIG mission and structure, our regulatory authority, and uh, our role in the IDS program area. I promise I'm going to be brief. I know it's the second day in the conference. It's after lunch. I'm the last speaker. Uh, <laughs> and I uh, believe I use that term loosely. I'm no speaker, and you're going to recognize that in a couple of minutes. I almost like, I think I drew, drew the uh, short straw in Boston. So anyway, uh, regarding our mission and structure, the statutory mission of the OIG is to improve HHS programs and operations and to protect those programs from fraud, waste, and abuse. Uh, we have about 1,400 uh, staff uh, throughout the country in our four compliance components. Uh, Daniel Levinson is our Inspector General. Uh, Mr. Levinson was... <coughs> He was appointed by the president. He was recently confirmed by the Senate. 
Our mission is carried out through a nationwide uh, independent and objective audits, investigations, uh, program evaluations conducted by our four components, uh, the Office of Audit Services, the Office of Investigations, the Office of Program uh, Pro of, uh, Evaluation and Inspections, and the Office of Counsel to the Inspector General. I'm not used to, I usually just use the acronyms, o OAS, OI, OSIG, OEI. I'm not used to spelling out these names, and as you, uh, you, if you didn't realize it before this conference, you're probably aware now that it's, it's like acronym soup. There's a ton of acronyms in the federal government, particularly with the uh, Department of Health and Human Services, so get used to it. Uh, to distinguish between, again, th through, these, through these audits, criminal and civil investigations, uh, program inspections, we try to provide independent, uh, timely, and reliable information to, uh, to the department officials, to the administration, to Congress, to the public. Uh, just a brief, we try to distinguish, distinguish between the four components. Again, I'm with the Office of Audit Services. We provide all auditing services to Health and Human Service. Uh, either directly with our own resources or as an oversight through contracted audits. Our Office of Investigations conducts criminal, civil, and administrative investigations uh, based on allegations of wrongdoing in the HHS programs. Um, their results, uh, OIs, investigations usually lead or, or quite often lead to uh, criminal uh, convictions, administrative sanctions, uh, and civil monetary penalties. The Office of Evaluation and Inspections, they conduct management and program reviews um, based on issues of uh, immediate concern, uh, concern of uh, the administration, Congress, the public. And finally, our Office of Counsel to the Inspector General provides general legal services to the OIG. They impose program exclusions and civil monetary penalties uh, against healthcare providers, and they litigate those actions uh, within the department, and they also settle. They, they also represent OIG in the settlement of uh, cases arising under the False Claims Act. They uh, they're busy. They develop corporate integrity agreements. They monitor those corporate in corporate integrity agreements. Um, they provide uh, compliance guidance and and other industry guidance. <coughs> With respect to our regulatory authority, I'm, you know I'm going to reinforce what Marilyn was talking about. Uh, she touched briefly on false claims and, uh, and civil monetary penalties. Sponsors and employers that participate in the Medicare Part D uh, program should be aware that the knowing submission of, of, uh, of false or fraudulent claims, uh, you know, is uh, it's, it's not a good thing. The False Claims Act, civil monetary penalties, they, they prohibit the knowing submission of false and fraudulent claims for payment to the United States. Um, these laws also prohibit the knowing submission of false records, false statements, in order to induce payment for false claims. Violations of either of these laws could result in uh, significant monetary penalties and fines for, for individuals or for, or for entities uh, that knowingly submit false claims or cause the submission of false claims. A finding that, of either, that either one of these laws has been violated uh, will depend on the facts and circumstances of, uh, of each situation. Uh, but it's important that, that sponsors and employers are aware of the potential penalties that could result from the submission of, of false claims. But it's equally important to note, as Marilyn was talking about, that um, the False Claims Act's liability provisions weren't intended uh, um, to apply to uh, innocent mistakes or inadvertent reporting errors. Our authority was granted under the Inspector General Act of 1978. It authorizes us to access to all records, reports, documents, reviews, prior audits, uh, any other available materials that are related to programs and operations that we have oversight responsibilities for. In reading the federal regulations uh, that were put out uh, for, for MMA, it, it refers to OIG's authority to conduct audits and pro program oversight activities in the IDS area. So in other words, sponsors must provide OIG any requested documentation for the purpose of audits and related oversight activities. Uh, this would include documentation to assure the integrity of actuarial attestations, uh, to ensure the, cap the accuracy of the subsidy payments, and so forth. If anybody has any specific concerns or questions regarding our regulatory authority, uh, anything about the uh, False Claims Act, uh, civil penalties, uh, civil monetary penalties law, 
I encourage them to contact our Office of, uh, of Public Affairs at 202-619-1343. Uh, you can also get additional guidance or information through our website at, uh, at www.oig.hhs.gov. Uh, a real brief discourse on, on, on our area, you know, again, I'm coming from the Office of Audit Services, and I'm just going to give you a, a quick spiel on, on what we do, how we approach our reviews. Um, we focus a, a real disproportionate, significant share of our resources in the Medicare program area due to the, um, due to the size and scope of the area, the, the, the program, uh, in terms of both significance to the beneficiaries and in terms of program expenditures. With the implementation of any, any new payment system, and there's been several of them re, uh, recently with respect to new health, with uh, respect to um, the health care providers, skilled nursing facilities, home health agencies, outpatient hospitals, inpatient um, uh, long-term care hospitals. Every one of them has a, a recent uh, new prospective payment system that's been indoctrinated within the last seven or eight years. Uh, and similar to, the, you know, with, with the IDS for, uh, for the employers, it's, it's similar. We'll take a look at at, uh, at the new payment systems. We conduct detailed reviews to identify any vulnerabilities uh, so that hopefully we can identify vulnerabilities in a timely manner and make recommendations that will protect the Med Medicare program's assets. <clears throat> when we initially review a new area such as the IDS, we would typically conduct uh, what we call a risk assessment. That would include a review of uh, laws, regulations, program guidance, uh, basically to determine the intent of that particular program or the component of that program, and then uh, allow us to, uh, to determine the criteria for compliance purposes. We'll do analysis of any available data, determine program participation and expenditures, and then we'll go out and do survey work, oftentimes in the field, at a provider level uh, or at the entity level, to, uh, to uh, determine you know, any, any kinds of weaknesses, um, how, the, how the program actually works, uh, and assess the level of risk. For those areas that when we believe the risk is high, we conduct detailed reviews to determine the extent and the materiality of the, of the, of the weakness. <clears throat> Our reviews often employ statistical sampling techniques, uh, nationwide or regional computer-based data matches, and validation work out at, at the field level to, uh, to confirm vulnerabilities, um, to determine underlying causes of noncompliance. And uh, those are the types of things that allow us to make the best possible recommendations to mitigate the problem and to, uh, you know, get the program back on the right foot. <clears throat> With respect to the uh, IDS, this provision of MMA, uh, you know, uh, the whole MMA, including the IDS, represents probably the most significant changes in the Medicare program um, since the inception. And there is potential risk in the IDS area due to several factors. Uh, most notably, you know, implementation, rather quick impl implementation, short time frame for the implementation, um, the potential significant amount of, of sponsors that will participate, and the significant amount of expenditures uh, that, will, that will be out there. Uh, consequently, our uh, FY 2006 work plan uh, will incorporate reviews in the IDS program area. Uh, our reviews, again, will focus on some of the key areas most notably actuarial uh, equivalents and the calculation of the drug subsidy payments. It's, it's very difficult to say exactly what we'll review the scope right now. I, I guess the best we could say is the nature, the timing, the extent of those reviews in those areas will depend on, on several factors. Um, when the data is available, what type of data is available, uh, OIG priorities that come up in other areas, and CMS's planned audit approaches, whether we can supplement what they're doing, complement their, their activities, if their needs arise and, and they want to uh, take advantage of some of our resources. So again, it's, it's, it's kind of up in the air now, but I, I'm sure at, at some juncture shortly we will be involved uh, in some form of detailed reviews. Uh, that's about all I have. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I learned a lot about what not to do. <laughs> wow. I, I, I just, I really learned a lot from that. I didn't realize there was such a problem out there. Maybe I've been naive all these years, huh? Wow. Can you imagine Marilyn showing up at our front door? 
Okay, I have been asked um, to announce another website um, that apparently several of you have inquired about, so I'm going to read it off to you. It's http colon backward slash backward slash www.cms.hhs.gov slash partnerships. And I understand this link is from the Medicare site as well. Let me repeat it one more time. It's http colon backward slash backward slash www.cms.hhs.gov slash partnerships. And I guess several of you have asked for this, so that's the only one. They're going to put some additional ones, I understand, up on the, uh, on the website as well. Having said that, we will now adjourn until 3 o'clock. At that time, we will come back. There will be an extended panel. I'm sure that during this time, several of you are going to want to direct some specific questions to the members individually during the break. However, they are going to do a pre-panel debriefing, or briefing, if you will. So they're going to come up here during that time uh, to get ready for the panel. So if they're not accessible to you, it's because they're getting ready for that uh, panel at 3 o'clock. Thank you. The reason I just said... <laughs>